For those who don't know, we're a natural history museum and educational institution um, located in Philadelphia. We're actually near Temple University. We were founded in 1855. We've been around a long time and our mission is free public education and science. So this is just one of many programs we offer. Um, we've been, of course, like so many of our colleagues and peers and everyone else, sheltering at home and staff have been working from home and our faculty and our speakers have um, kindly been supporting us from far away, including Scott, who has pioneered our first digital series of public science talks. So we're really grateful to Scott for doing that for us. And um, we envision a lot more digital talks moving forward for at least a few months. Um, tonight is the last in a series of three talks by Scott McRobert who is sharing stories of his research and his life at the Biodiversity Lab he runs at St. Joseph's University. The lab, as you will see, or you may already know, houses hundreds of rare, exotic, and endangered species, and each week has focused on a different part of his research and highlights different animals at the lab. So for those of you here for the first time, Scott is a professor of biology at St. Joseph's University where he teaches courses on biology, environmental science, and sustainability. He created and runs the Biodiversity Lab where his research focuses on animal behavior, ecology, and conservation. Many of his projects aim to build an understanding of the biology and life cycles of the threatened and endangered animals that he studies, and his goal is improving the odds of their survival. That work and a behind the scenes look at his lab is the topic of the talks that we've had, each focused on a different animal and a different aspect of Scott's work. Scott also has a long relationship with the Wagner, we're proud to say. He's part of our GeoKids Links partnership with, between the Wagner and St. Joseph's University's biology department that brings hands-on science to elementary and middle school kids at six North Philadelphia schools. <coughs> He's given many talks at the Wagner. These are the first remote talks, um, including he was our evening with an expert speaker about reptiles and amphibians in our own collection about a year ago. We love having him as a speaker. We're grateful to him for putting this series together for us. Um, our very first digital talk series in 165 years of operation. So you're now part of history, Scott. That's the long intro to Scott. Many of you on this call, I think already know him. So I'll give the short intro. This is Scott, he likes turtles, the subject of tonight's talk. <laughs> um, before I turn it completely over to Scott, just a few logistics. Um, I'm introducing Corinne Woke, who you also see on your screen. She's our communications and program coordinator. She helped do all the sign up for this and is helping to manage uh, the logistics. Um, she will be in charge of the Q&A, which will follow Scott's presentation. As I said, we've muted you. If you come unmuted for some reason, please mute yourself again, just to limit background noise. And um, uh, so do that now if you haven't. Um, she will also moderate the Q&A that will follow. We're gonna use the chat function for that. Um, hopefully you're all familiar with chat now after a few months of Zooming. Um, it's the green arrow, should be on the bottom of your screen. Post your question to everyone. Um, Corinne will collect them and then she'll pitch them to Scott who will answer them. Um, if you need any technical help, um, sort of not a big question, private chat that to either me or Corinne and we'll try to help you out during, during the program. But I'm now gonna turn it over to Scott with many thanks. Okay, can you hear me? I'm gonna try to share my screen. Hold on, technical difficulties. There we go. Can everyone see that? Yes, no, yes. <laughs> I can't see anybody. I'm uh, very proud to be part of the first remote series of talks at the Wagner. That's it's a long history to do something as a first. So I, I hadn't thought about that before. Welcome to everyone who's here tonight, and uh, some of you are first timers, and I think some of you have been here for some of the other talks. The title of 
tonight's talk is kind of long and ponderous. Conservation of endangered turtles and poison dart frogs as models to study global climate change. It turns out with all of those words, I'm only going to talk about one fairly short study with the frogs. We'll do that up front. Most of this is going to be about <clears throat> turtles. Once I started looking at all the stuff we do with turtles, I realized we just don't have an awful lot of room to do the frogs. So we will talk mostly about conservation of endangered turtles. Uh, to start out, I should welcome, uh, I should wish everyone a happy World Turtle Day. This is a poster from a few years ago. World Turtle Day happens every year on May 23rd, so it happened last Saturday. I actually don't know what World Turtle Day is all about. I didn't know about it until maybe a year or so ago, and I, have, I don't have any idea what people do for it, but I figured it's something that ought to be mentioned in a talk about turtles. Now, for those of you newcomers, this series of talks is about the unusual laboratory that I run. And each week I start out by giving you a few glimpses of that. And some of you have, have been at this place and some of you have worked at this place. But for those of you who don't know it, the Biodiversity Lab is a series of spaces at St. Joseph University. It's actually a, a, a number of different laboratories and a roof greenhouse. And as you can see from the pictures, these rooms are lined with tanks and buckets and tubes, and we've got a lot of very, very unusual habitats set up across these different laboratory spaces. And we work with animals that are considered to be rare or exotic, and for the most part, not the types of animals you would expect to find in a scientific laboratory. And there's some pictures of a few. We have lots of turtles, as you might imagine. We've got a lot of fish. We have lots of frogs. We have insects. We have lizards. And in, for the most part, it's just a, a, a remarkable series of spaces. Uh, the labs are like small zoos rather than what you normally think of as a scientific laboratory. Um, now, each week, in these talks, I've focused on some of the research that we do in these labs. The first week we talked about shoaling behavior, which is social behavior in fish, which makes up a large part of the work that we do. Last week we talked about reproductive behavior in fruit flies. And this is the work that I actually started doing when I came here to St. Joe's. This is the work that I did as a grad student and when St. Joseph's University hired me, they thought this was what I was going to do. I was going to have one room full of bottles of fruit flies. And uh, that's all they really bargained for. They didn't bargain for five separate labs and a greenhouse full of rare and exotic species. But that's the beauty of tenure. Once, you, <laughs> once you've gotten past that hurdle, you can take a few chances. So in the first two weeks, we've focused on these two lines of research in the lab. And tonight, we're going to talk about two other lines of research, one involving turtles, and we'll spend most of the time doing that. And then at the beginning, I'm going to talk a little bit about some work that we, we do with frogs. For the most part, though, each week, I've talked about science in a normal laboratory. And again, biologists you know, by definition, are working with living things. And if you look at most biological laboratories, what you'll find is a lab that is built around a type of question. And a biologist may be asking a certain type of question. It might be a genetic question, it might be a developmental question, or a neurobiology question, something like that. And once they've established the question, they look for the proper species to study. And you see certain animals and yeast and bacteria and plants that are considered to be model species. Model species are usually easy to get. They're usually easy to maintain. You can find good foods for them. They don't take up much space. And they've got some attribute that makes them particularly good for the type of question you're asking. In my laboratory, we tend to do what is I consider to be backwards science. We start out in many cases, and with everything you see tonight, this is really true, 
we start out with an interest in a particular type of animal. And the animals we're interested in, for the most part, are rare, exotic, or they have some conservation aspect. They're endangered, they're in declining populations. We start out by finding the animals that we're interested in. And again, usually not stuff that's easy to get or maintain, but we find ways to get them. Sometimes that takes a lot of work. Sometimes you get, have to have these things shipped from different countries. Sometimes you have to have permits to keep them and to move them. So we go to some great lengths to get these things. We get them in the lab. We find ways of keeping them, maintaining them. And then once we've done that, we start looking to see if there may be something that we could ask and some scientific work we could do. And with the first two, ta the first two weeks, those species weren't all that difficult. The first week I talked about fish, and we've got a lot of different fish in the lab, lots of unusual species. But the question we ask on shoaling behavior is actually pretty straightforward. We put them in these specially designed tanks, and they generate data fairly easily. The Drosophila I talked about last week, that's a model organism, and lots of labs work with Drosophila. Tonight, I'm going to talk about turtles and frogs, and and by frogs, these are exotic frogs, poison frogs. And I've got to tell you, for the most part, these would not be considered model species. They'd be considered the opposite. They are miserable species to keep and very hard to ask questions about scientifically. The reason we've got these animals is really simple, and it's not particularly scientific, and that is we just love them. And as Susan said, introducing me, I like turtles. I've liked turtles my whole life. I don't know why. I still am more excited to see a turtle than just about anything else I can think of. And so I've packed the lab with turtles and rare frogs. And what I'm going to tell you tonight are some of the questions we've developed to try to do a bit of science while we're maintaining these remarkable species. So let's start out with part one of the talk which is the frog part. And we'll start this with a very simple question, and that is, what, what do you do with a colony of poison dart frogs? Now, I was always fascinated by frogs. They come in a close second to turtles, but uh, I'm still amazed by frogs, and I love seeing them. And poison dart frogs, I think most of you are aware of, these are these remarkably brightly colored animals that come from different parts of the world, traditionally Central and South America. And then there's a number of them that also come from some African nations as well. The animals are incredible colors because they don't need to worry about hiding in the woods. As a matter of fact, they do the opposite. They demonstrate themselves. They are incredibly bright and brilliant coloration. And it's a marker to any potential predator that if you try to eat me, you're gonna die. And they, are, they carry with them some very potent toxins. And for the most part, they hardly have any predators whatsoever. So I was fascinated by these animals and I developed a relationship with the Philadelphia Zoo who were, who were kind of interested in my lab. And decades ago, they decided to give me their entire colony of poison dart frogs. And these were animals of a species called Dendrobates erratus. It's the little green ones that you see here. And so we got them into the laboratory and we set them up, found ways to keep them. And we found out that not only were we pretty good at keeping them, but we were pretty good at breeding them. And now we were getting frog eggs and then tadpoles and we had lots of them around and I thought we need to think of something we can do to study these animals. And obviously the first choice would be, let's study global climate change, <laughs> which um, actually, it seems to be a bit of a far-fetched idea. But I was teaching about global climate change in my environmental science course and still do to this day. And global climate change has a whole series of parameters that it affects, one of which is simple enough, which is global warming. And you see by the chart here, you simply can plot the change in CO2 levels in the planet and you see a, a corresponding change in the temperature as CO2 levels go up, the temperature of the planet's going up. And so it was a simple enough question to say, 
what if the temperature goes up a few degrees? What would it do to an animal that is so tied to water the way a frog is? And so we decided to run a study on this species again, Dendrobates erratus, um, to see what happens to this animal when we change the temperature where we incubate the tadpoles. The experiment's pretty straightforward. Here's the life cycle of a frog. This is not exactly a, a poison frog, but frogs, like all amphibians, they lay their eggs in the water. The, the eggs hatch into a larval form, which in many cases is called a tadpole. The tadpole is a little feeding machine that eats as much as it can for a period of time. Then it sprouts legs, back legs first, then front legs. And then for lots of these amphibians, frogs and salamanders, they come out of the water and spend the rest of their life as terrestrials. They don't all do that. Some of them stay in the water. Some of them come out of the water for a while, then go back to the water later. But for the most part, they spend a period of time in the water as, a as an egg and then a tadpole, then they leave the water as an adult. So what we did was we set up a tank, and this is a, a diagram of the side of a fish tank with some bricks in it and a filter and deep water and these individual containers that had slits in them. And we could keep a single tadpole in each container or a group of tadpoles in a single container. And then each tank was monitored at a different temperature. And at the time I was working at a field station in Costa Rica that I visited a couple of times. And this is an area where Dendrobates erratus lives and we were able to take the temperature down there and we made one tank the normal natural temperature that was found in Costa Rica. And then we made one tank that was a little bit cooler and then two tanks that were warmer. And what we did was then measure the metamorphosis of the tadpoles. We would feed them, keep them happy, and wait until they climbed out of the water as, a, as an indicator of metamorphosis. And the results are actually quite good. This study was published back in the 1990s and it was one of the first good studies to show that the potential of global warming could change the biology of a tropical species. So we see here, these are numbers of days until metamorphosis, and then down here is the temperature of the tank. This is 26.2 degrees centigrade. That's the normal temperature found in the wild for this species. And you see that they go through metamorphosis in about 60 days. So in the water for 60 days and then they come out. If you raise the temperature just a bit, about three degrees, you don't see much of a difference here. They come out also in about uh, 60 days. But the difference that we see is interesting if we, del if we turn the temperature down a bit, which is not a concern of global warming, but it's a nice control in the experiment. If we drop the temperature down about four degrees, what happens is the cooler water makes it take longer for them to go to metamorphosis. This is significant and they take about 80 days. But the global warming question comes over here at 31 degrees where we've warmed the water up quite a bit and it takes these animals about 120 days to reach metamorphosis that doubles the metamorphosis rate. The other thing that we saw in this experiment, and it wasn't something we expected right off the bat, was we saw a significant difference in survival as well. Now this is survival rate. These are animals that make it through the metamorphosis compared to those that don't. You see at the normal temperature, almost, it's about 95%, almost 100% of them make it through. Same for the temperature just slightly warmer. Down here at the cooler temperature where it takes them longer, you see a survival rate that's lower than 50%. And then if you go over here to the global warming temperature, the quite warm temperature, the survival rate's down to 5%, which is dramatic. Now, when we talked about this project, we got a little bit of criticism because they said that the numbers we used are quite dramatic, and they are. This is a, a, about a five degree difference in temperature, which would be a remarkable change. Although what we're seeing now in global warming is we've raised the temperature over a degree of the entire planet, and some pockets in the world are rising even farther than that. Now, no one's seen five degrees, and this is an outline, this is a, a, an extreme temperature, but the take home message from this is that water temperature is critically important to these animals and the normal temperature leads to very fast metamorphosis and a high degree of success. 
And if you alter that in some ways, a little cooler, a little bit hotter, you can have a dramatic effect. Now, the other thing that happens in this study that I wanted to mention, for those of you who listened in last week, I was saying that in the research in my lab, we try our best not to harm any animals. And that actually cuts down on some of the research projects that we do. We never take on a project where we would intentionally harm an animal. We don't do that. We're just not interested in that kind of, kind of research. The lab is built on a type of respect for the animals and we do everything we can to show them respect in, in the management of them in the lab and in the study of them. And this study ends up with one group of animals that had an effect on their, on their survival. And I didn't expect that going in. And the science here is very good and I'm proud of it. But I do have to admit, I don't like that aspect of the study. And for that reason, we try not to do things quite as extremely as we did in this study. And you'll see that come up again in another study. Now, in terms of amphibians, we've tried to replicate this study a number of times with a temperate species. We've actually tried to replicate it with a few other poison dart frogs, but we haven't found any that produce enough offspring. So we've been looking for a temperate species. So we live in a temperate part of the world here in Pennsylvania. Temperate simply means you have four seasons instead of the tropics that simply have a warm, they're warm year round and they have a wet and a dry season. In a temperate world, we have four distinct seasons. The animal around here that produces prodigious amounts of offspring is the American toad. And every year they sing in great numbers and you can go out and collect uh, the eggs and you can collect the tadpoles. We started doing this a long time ago and it began as an educational outreach. And these are students, including my daughter from Friends Central School, a school down the street from us here, and we actually had the first sets of data in this study collected by second graders. And the purpose of that was to show that science, if you make it simple and straightforward, is accessible to just about anybody. It makes perfect sense. And it's actually quite exciting to kids to be working with something as exciting as these toads. And Friends Central School has a little pond behind it with toads singing and they had their own tadpoles. So it seemed to be a, an obvious thing to do. Since then though, we've tried to do this in a much more rigorous scientific way, and it is not an easy study to do. And we've tried it every single year. And the way the study is set up is similar to what we did with the, with the poison dart frogs. These are tanks with individual cups. Every cup has a single tadpole in it, a little bit of a plant and a popsicle stick to climb out. Now, all you do then is keep different tanks at different temperatures and wait till they come out of the water. The project design is simple, which I love, but the devil is really in the details here. And what happens is the poor student who ends up running this study is in for a much more difficult time than you would see just on the surface of looking at something like this. Now, last year, my daughter Kaylee, who ran my lab during the summer, she took a crack at this because we do this every year. We, want, we want run a number of toad tadpoles and we gain some data. And what she found, and it was driving her crazy, was that no matter how hard you work, and every day you've got to feed these guys, you've got to keep them clean, you've got to make sure they're healthy, you've got to monitor them, see how the leg growth is progressing, take data on the size and so forth, and then wait till they leave the water. More often than not, at the end of a day, you'll have a whole bunch of tadpoles in the water who've got legs, but they don't look like they're anywhere near getting out of the water. And you come in the next day and five or six of them are out hopping all around the lab. And then you've got to find them, figure out where they came from and then take measures. It's not an easy study to do. It's simple, but it's not an easy study to do. Now this year, I had a student in my lab, Kelsey Bellamia, who wanted to do this, desperate to do this. And then of course we ran into a little thing called coronavirus, but undaunted, Kelsey decided to go through with this. And so I collected a bunch of tadpoles and Kelsey, these are pictures from her parents' house. She bought tanks, got the cups, set them up, and she has this going on in her parents' house right this minute. And so it's not a huge study. She's only doing a couple of tanks, but it's a, a wonderful, uh, investment of time despite the fact that and, and at the moment we're not allowed to do research in this building the governor of Pennsylvania says no to that but Kelsey can do it in her house so we're still doing a little bit of frog research 
right now uh, to see what we can do for the next step of this experiment on temperature changes in metamorphosis. So that's the frog part. The second part of this talk is really the rest of my laboratory, which what can you do with a million turtles? Aren't they cute? Now, for me, there doesn't have to be anything more than that. Just a whole bunch of turtles in a tank is good enough for everything that I want in the laboratory. But we have, with all the turtles we've gotten, look for a number of different venues to ask questions and collect some data. Now, some of it is somewhat simplistic science. It's not necessarily earth shattering. But again, turtles are not easy to study and we're not trying to hurt anything. So it limits the things we're going to do. Now, early on when we started putting turtles in the lab, we were searching out different species and we could find them in various venues. But one of the things that started happening early on was we became a space for turtle rescue. And that wasn't exactly what we set up to do. But it turns out there's a lot of people out there who have turtles who want to find a home for them. Now, sometimes these are animals in pet shops that are not doing well, and we've gotten a bunch of those. These are animals that have been taken to vets, veterinarians, and left there because they were injured. We've gotten some of them. Sometimes these are just people who have a pet who realize that a turtle is not a good pet and they want to find a, a home for it. The reasons turtles aren't good pets necessarily are they, they're very hard to keep. They're messy animals. You've got to put them in a tank. They start growing and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. They take a lot of filtration, constant cleaning. And I have a whole staff of students, at least when the world is normal, whose time is spent primarily cleaning out turtle tanks. And right now I have three students who we consider to be essential personnel uh, as deemed by the governor of Pennsylvania. And their job is primarily to come in each day of the week and clean turtle tanks. But people get turtles and they find this out. They don't like them so much. And the other thing about a turtle is it will outlive you. The life expectancy for most, tur most turtles is 80 to 100 years. And so it's a bit more of a commitment than most people know. So we began getting rescue turtles in here. And we like that to an extent. We, we can't save the world. We can't take everything that was offered to us. But while looking at this as a possibility, I started to investigate the idea of turtle rescue as a grant possibility. And I became aware of this group called the Dietrich W. Botstever Foundation. Now they're a philanthropic group that does a lot of things. And I mean, they are all over the board on the different types of things they do. Educational outreach programs, teaching programs, all sorts of different things but also a little bit of animal stuff, but some unusual stuff, like they save race horses that have been mistreated. So someone put me onto them and I wrote them this long grant about turtles. And it was this long involved thing about research and it was 30 pages long, all this detailed stuff about how I wanna study turtles in captivity. And we're gonna learn all this stuff about the biology of turtles, blah, 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 blah. It was actually quite a good grant, but they wrote me back and they said, no, you don't get us. We don't do that. We're not looking for research. We just want to save things and we're not that interested in biology. So I thought about that for a second and I wrote them back and um, I'd been seeing these pictures that my wife had been sending me from her trips to Asia where they sell turtles in markets. They're a common food source in markets. And I'd been to Chinatown in Philadelphia and they do the same thing there. You see turtles in fairly terrible conditions. So I wrote back to the Botstever Foundation and I just wrote them one paragraph. And I said, you know, I love turtles. We can keep turtles. We can take care of them. What if we just went down to Chinatown and picked out some animals that are in bad situations and saved them and brought them in and we called it the New Life Program. And we said, we're just going to take animals that have no, no future, and we're going to give them a great life for the rest of their life. And the Botstever Foundation said, now that's what we do. <laughs> and they founded it. And so we ran this for a number of years. I actually made it part of my ecology course. Students went out and they surveyed the markets in Chinatown, and they kept data on what markets were selling what turtles. And you see some of the turtles in the Chinatown markets in terrible situations. 
and we would buy them sometimes as babies and bring them in and take measurements of them and we turned it into science and sometimes adults and we would raise these animals in captivity and we ran this for a few years and it was a, an interesting type of sort of focused research program and I love it. And we still have the turtles here today. Here's one of the, the females. This is a, a, a large turtle who had been brought in as a baby. And so we are keeping good to our word. The science is interesting. It taught our students some good uh, sort of urban ecology in an odd way. Survey Chinatown markets, collect species information and numbers, bring them back and raise them in captivity. So we get into this focused res uh, rescue project, which is an interesting type of work. Now, as that progressed, we became more and more interested in animals that needed rescue for a very different reason completely. And we started turning our attention to very rare turtles that had a conservation status. And when you think about conservation, there's a lot of different ways to categorize species across the world and there's lots of big conservation groups but this is a thing called the red list and it lists species by their their position in terms of the size of their population and the threat facing them and as you work your way across it they start over here on the left these are animals that have not been these are species it could be animals or plants that have not been evaluated yet and that really represents most of the species on the planet if you go here, these are species that are studied, but there's not very much data. Once you get then into the adequate data region, it's best to be over here on the left. As you go to the right, things are getting worse and worse. The left, the first is least concerned. This means there's a lot of data and things are going pretty well. Your population's pretty big. You go over here to near threatened. This means that there's still plenty of you out there, but there's a problem. Something is affecting your population and there could be a decline and there could be problems in the future. Then you get into the big three. This category here, these are populations that are in serious decline. And again, as you move to the right, things get worse. Vulnerable means your population is in strong decline and there are serious problems, but there's still a fair number of you left Endangered means you've gotten to the point where you have such a small population size that drastic measures need to be taken or else you will not be able to replenish yourself. Critically endangered means there's probably so few of you left that there is no hope for survi adequate survival in the wild. Then you go to this new category, which is extinct in the wild, which means every single member of your species is gone in the natural world, but you're still alive somewhere in captivity, and then finally extinct. And in biology, extinct is extinct. It means you're all gone, you're not coming back. I hate to break this to you, but Jurassic Park, uh, they cut a few corners there in terms of the genetics and developmental biology. Uh, we're not bringing anything back that has been listed as extinct. So we started working with a group called the Turtle Survival Alliance that is a, a major conservation group that works with turtles. And you have to have a group like this work with you if you're going to work with highly endangered species. Otherwise, it's illegal to get them. So the Turtle Survival Alliance came and checked us out. They sent some representatives to check out the lab. They decided that we do pretty good work here. And they decided that they wanted to put some turtles in my laboratory in what are called assurance colonies. And this is another type of rescue, but this rescue has a very different parameter to it completely. An assurance colony is a group of species in captivity that you're keeping alive, keeping happy, to assure that there's some of them left when they go extinct in the wild. It's got some kind of a sad aspect to it, but there's some hope with it as well because you wanna make sure you don't lose these species with the hopes of someday finding a way of replenishing them in the wild and bringing them back to their, their normal glory. And we've got a number of these assurance colonies. I'll just show you where they are. Uh, we're not doing research on these animals. We simply take measurements of them. They're great for educational, uh, the educational aspect. It's terrific to be able to show students that have these wonderful 
strong categories. People hear about an endangered species, but they rarely see one. So we've got some wonderful, this is, the, this, this is a yellow spotted Amazon river turtle. We have two of them, uh, Sid and Manny. They're two brothers, they came in as babies. Uh, they're listed as vulnerable. They're from uh, the Amazon Delta uh, Basin in Brazil. And they're big boys now. These are two very, very large turtles. Uh, so we've got a couple of them. Uh, these are spotted pond turtles from India. These are species that are uh, considered to be endangered. We have two of them, Bubba and uh, Rio, also two males. We had a bigger colony of these, but we moved some of them on to another conservation group that was doing breeding. We decided we didn't want to get into the breeding business of these particular animals. They're very large and difficult to keep, but wonderful. These were the hardest species I ever managed to get. They, they came out of India. They were fronted by the Turtle Survival Alliance. They went to the Denver Zoo, then to the Philly Zoo, and then to us. Uh, these are very rare animals to find in, well, find anywhere outside of, of India. We have Reeves turtles. These are an endangered species from Japan that up until recently were being sold at uh, pet auctions. And we managed to pick some of these up before that was outlawed. Uh, yellow margin box turtles from Thailand. We have one of these. We used to have a colony of these. We've also moved that on to another conservation group. We were breeding these animals for a while. And you see with the lovely little babies uh, from these guys. But we've still got one of these in the lab. Uh, and then the final one I want to show you tonight are Vietnamese leaf turtles. Uh, we have a colony of these. We have six of them. When they came, this took a lot of effort on our part to get these animals. They came in as babies and now they're full-grown adults. These are animals that live in rice paddies all across regions of uh, Asia, including Vietnam. And when these animals came into our lab, they were listed as, as endangered. Since then, they have bumped down the list to <clears throat> critically endangered. But the work on these turtles now shows that they have not been seen in the wild. Sorry, my phone uh, rang. Uh, these animals have not been seen in the wild for five years. And the thought is that they may be about to be bumped down to extinct in the wild, which is quite sad. Now, the good news is they do very well in captivity. And the ones we have are doing just fabulous uh, in, in captivity. And there's a number of these around. The problem is ecologically, there's nowhere in the world for them to go right now. And hopefully there's, that's gonna change someday in the future. In the meantime, we're maintaining these animals. And again, they're great educationally. Uh, and someday maybe there'll be a way that we can put them back out into nature. Now, moving on, again, I'm jumping from all the different work we do. We do a lot of field work, which is quite a bit different from the stuff I've taught you about before. All of this has been about the lab and all the things going on in the lab. But we found that we also can do some fairly interesting field work, and we do it in a number of places in this area. Um, the first I'm going to talk to you about is a, is a community survey of turtles at the John Hines Wildlife Refuge, which is down by the Philadelphia Airport. Now, last week I talked to you about a survey that we do of Drosophila. We collect fruit flies in the wild and count up the different numbers of different populations out there. We did a study at John Hines where we do the same thing on turtles. Now the John Hines Wildlife Refuge is the biggest uh, protected, protected wildlife area in the Northeastern United States. It's a huge wetland area. It's a tidal wetland. The tides come in, it rises, it go, they go, the water goes down. When the tides go out, it's, uh, it's brackish water. It's a mixture of fresh water and salt water. And it is absolutely packed with turtles. So I set up a study for a couple of my students who ran this, a grad student, uh, David Case, and an undergrad, Maria Galassi, and they spent a summer out there. We built traps. These are wonderful traps. It's a big uh, quadrant here with a net underneath it. We built a basking ramp. The turtles got up here and basked, and then you would scare them, and they'd jump in and get caught in the net. Or you just go in the water in the canoe and catch them. And then we would bring these turtles in and measure them and pit tag them, which means we'd inject them with a tag that carries a fair amount of information on them. 
and then put them out back out there. And now in the future, we can go back and collect turtles and you have a pit tag reader. And if you find an animal that you'd collected in the past, you can see that with the pit tag reader and it gives you all the information we got in the earlier survey. What we found in the summer of 2013 was we collected 13 of these red-bellied turtles, these big, beautiful turtles that are listed as an endangered species in the US. We caught 37 great, big, beautiful snapping turtles. Snapping turtles are absolutely wonderful. They'll bite your fingers off, but they're absolutely beautiful animals. Uh, they caught 41 eastern painted turtles, which is kind of the classic species for this part of the world, common pond turtles we see. They're doing very well in the wild, but just remarkable. And then, 45 red-eared sliders. Now, red-eared sliders are the most common species in the world. They are met, they're found in every single part of the world that can support turtles, even though they're normally found in the Southeast United States. These are the animals that used to be sold in pet shops and still are the most common turtles sold in pet shops. And what happens is people all over the world are buying them and then they can't find me to give them to, so they let them go. And these turtles do very well in the wild. And it took a lot of work to get the state of Pennsylvania to allow me to collect these turtles as part of this survey and then release them back into the wild. The law says that if you're out in Pennsylvania, and this is true of most places in the, in the United States, and you collect an, in, a, an invasive species, whether it's a fish or a turtle, you have to kill it. So they told me, if you do this study at John Hines and catch any red-eared sliders, you gotta kill them. And I'm like, well, you don't know me, that isn't gonna happen. But I finally convinced them that they've gotta get used to these red-eared sliders. Me killing a few turtles or even keeping them in my lab isn't gonna have anything to do with really the numbers of them that are out there at John Hines. And if we're gonna do good ecology, we've gotta look at the new normal. And the new normal is this is the turtle community out there. And even though they're invasive, they're part of it. And so we did this wonderful study and I, I won a little bit of a battle with the state of Pennsylvania and they finally allowed me to do red-eared sliders and put them back out there. So I was happy about that. Now, finally, that work and field work brings me to the last set of studies I wanna to mention to you tonight. And these all center around a remarkable species known as a diamondback terrapin. Diamondback terrapins are brackish water turtles. They're found along the east coast of the U.S. They start all the way up here in Massachusetts, go all the way around Florida and all the way to Texas, but they only live in this short, tight, narrow coastal range. They live in brackish water, which is water where the ocean meets rivers and mixes. So it's not as salty as the ocean and it's not fresh water. And that's the only place these animals can live. They're beautiful and remarkable. They come in a whole series of different subspecies and they're a very uh, common species that's seen at the New Jersey shore where we do our work. However, they're listed as vulnerable because their population is in decline across this entire region, some places worse than others. The biggest problem for them is habitat loss. Uh, they're, the places they're being, they live are being bulldozed and built on and roads are being built around them, which have tremendous impact on the females. They're also being collected. They used to be a big part of the food trade, which is now mostly illegal. And they're still part of the pet trade, which is mostly illegal, but people are still doing this. The roads only affect the females though, which is interesting. The turtles live in the water and the males never leave the water. But when the females are gravid, that means they're gonna lay eggs, they have to come up on land. And now since roads are built right along the beaches, they almost always have to cross a road to lay eggs and then cross it again to get back. So the roads have an impact on the females and the roads have an impact on the babies. So we are, we get interested in these turtles because we were working with them with a group at the Jersey Shore for some time. And we started asking a lot of questions one big question that I'll talk about first is the effect of roads. And then we'll get back to what we started with tonight, which is climate change. We talk about that with frogs. We also have looked at that a little bit with turtles. Now, a number of years ago, one of my students named Stephanie Surlag ran this remarkable study on road ecology of turtles in uh, Southern New Jersey. And she worked on a place called the Great Bay Boulevard, which is this long road that runs right down through the middle of Terrapin territory. 
and she broke it into six sections. And she, what she would do is walk up and down the road collecting turtles every day for the entire nesting season. And you see, this is what the road looks like. The water's over here, the turtles come up, they have to cross this road to lay their eggs. They don't lay their eggs over here because the water, it, it, the high tide inundates the nest. So they come over here and lay their eggs here. So they run the risk of being hit crossing, they lay their eggs, they run the risk of being hit going back, and then when the babies hatch, they run the risk of being hit. The study was pretty dramatic. She did eight to 10 surveys a day, plus she put traffic counters on the road to measure traffic. She collected uh, 1,206 terrapins. She also found 104 road mortalities. These were turtles that were hit in between her canvassing the roads. Um, she found out that road mortality was directly affected by traffic volume, which makes sense, but someone had to show us that. So the places, especially up here, zone six had the highest amount of traffic, it had the highest amount of mortalities, and streams also had the highest amount of mortalities, like this stream here. The turtles apparently love getting in these streams and then leaving the water. Uh, she tagged 300 turtles with pit tags, and she found that she recaptured 65 of them in a single season. These were turtles who were nesting more than once. Up until now, no one knew they nested more than once. She even found one female who nested five times. Uh, so she had multiple clutches. So this amazing study, very labor intensive with some terrific results. And it's led to a mitigation project down there where we have put drift fences in the areas where the turtles are primarily being hit, which diverts them to lower traffic parts of the road. And then we see if the, we can lower the mortality on these females. Now that project and canvassing these roads is something that goes on every single year. And it leads to the next project we're involved with, which is a Head Start program, which is one of the most wonderful projects I do I don't run it, but I'm involved with it. And in this project, baby terrapins that are either hatched in captivity or sent to my lab as eggs and hatched here, we raise them in captivity. So we get the joy of being around baby terrapins for about nine months. We get them big and then they're taken back and released by school groups. So it's an educational outreach as well. And the idea of this is that when baby turtles first hatch, they're tiny and everything preys on them, birds, crabs, fish, everything. And so what you do is you raise them in captivity so they're a bit bigger, little turtles going to bigger turtles. And now when you release them, you may reduce the chances of some of this predation. It's a little bit of a controversial conservation idea. There's some people who disagree. They don't think that it really works. It's difficult to find out data, although this is what they do with sea turtles every single year. They collect sea turtles by the thousands, raise them until they're bigger, and then release them. So we've been doing this for over a decade now. We get to have these wonderful little babies in the lab, and the big project is we just get them bigger and then release them and hope that we're helping the population in the wild. But while they're with us, it gives us a chance to ask some questions. And so we decided to do a climate study. Now, climate change, global climate change, which is really what's happening. Everyone gets caught up with global warming. Global warming is just part of global climate change. Climate change is everything. It's the fact that, yes, the temperature is going up, but you see more severe storms. You see this level of the oceans rising you see flooding, you see fires and droughts in some places. Climate change is a whole lot of different things. At the coastal part of the ocean, climate change leads to two possible effects. One is a change in pH. It turns out that carbon dioxide, when it's taken up by the ocean, goes through a series of chemical changes and it makes the ocean water more acidic. So it's possible that our eggs and our baby turtles will experience lower pH. It also affects salinity and the reason it affects salinity is as the water, as the ocean level rises, it inundates nests and nests may be now subject to saltier water rather than the fresh water coming from, from the rivers. And so we have these experiments we've run. These were run a few years ago by a grad student named Brian Cron, who did this wonderful set of studies 
to look at both eggs and baby turtles and ask some very general uh, climate change questions. So we look at the effects of pH and salinity on eggs and the treatments are pretty straightforward. You have these containers with sand in them. The eggs are placed in the bottom just like a normal nest. It drains and they're kept in incubators. And every day, Brian would water them with one or of different types of water. It could be normal water, normal. This is the normal salinity and pH found in the area of New Jersey where they come from. Or treatment one, higher salinity, but normal pH. Treatment two, normal salinity, but lower pH. And then treatment three, the total experimental, high salinity and low pH. He would monitor the eggs and just look for hatching and then size of the babies when they came out. Now, there's a lot of data here. Don't worry, don't worry about it. The bottom line is we found no significant effects whatsoever. So here are the four different, control, the four different groups. Incubation time in days, about 70 days. The weight at hatching, the size of the shell, the top shell and the bottom shell at hatching. The bottom line here is that for these conditions, we saw no effect, no significant effects. So a small change in pH, a small change in salinity, the turtles were exactly normal, the, and it didn't have an effect on the eggs. We then looked at the same two questions for babies and looked at their growth for 18 weeks in captivity. And here's a turtle with a shell marking with nail polish, which we eventually take off. It doesn't hurt them in any way, but allows you to identify them. Raise the turtles under different conditions with different water chemistry, and measure them on a weekly basis and then collect the data. <clears throat> what you see, again, looks like a lot of stuff going on here, but there's not many results to really mention. This is the effect of salinity on growth over 18 weeks. For the shell size, the top shell and bottom shell, no effects. The only effect we see significant is that the lower salinity turtles, is that right? I'm really right. The low salinity turtles grew more significantly in terms of weight than the higher salinity turtles. So the one effect we get on higher salinity is it may have an effect on growth rate in terms of weight. It may reduce it somewhat. Now the, um, hold on, sorry. So uh, the weight of the terrapins uh, is affected by that, but there's no other changes. And then the second study is on pH, we took a look at, and overall what we see here is weight differences uh, normal pH and lower pH, and then the size of the shell. The bottom line here is no significant differences seen whatsoever. So we didn't see any results coming from that at all. Now the conclusions of that, and it's the last study I'm gonna to mention tonight, I wanna give you a little bit of a statement on the effects of pH and salinity and uh, uh, on turtle eggs, terrapin eggs, and baby terrapins. First of all, in terms of eggs, if you change the pH and salinity, you see no effects on egg incubation or size at hatching, which is fine. Sometimes I tell my students, this is okay. You don't have to find significance. As long as you run the study correctly, the information is correct. You've got to do it. You don't have to find a significant result. So I love this result. So a small change in pH or salinity, and the eggs are just fine. In terms of juvenile growth, in salinity, we change the salinity slightly, and what we find is that really higher salinity leads to a lower growth than the normal condition, which is lower salinity, in terms of weight, but otherwise no changes at all. And in terms of pH, a slight lowering of the pH has no effects whatsoever. So this turns out, in my estimation, to be a, a remarkable study. Very straightforward, very labor intensive, as you can imagine. This is 18 weeks of work, tons of work, water chemistry, measurements of turtles, and so forth. But it brings me to the last point I wanted to make, which was a point I made earlier in this series of talks, and that is, what are the limitations of this study? The limitations of the study are the mild alterations that we use in terms of the changes from normal conditions. We could have changed salinity much greater, in a much greater way, much bigger ranges of salinity changes. And we could have changed pH in much more dramatic ways. And there's almost no doubt we would have gotten more dramatic effects, significant effects, one of which would have been mortality. And while that might have been a very important study to do, and it, it actually would be, it's not for us. Again, the basic premise in my laboratory is we love these animals more than anything else, and we love doing good 
well put together science, but we learn from the frogs that if you change these parameters dramatically, you may see a loss in survival. And while we wanna ask great questions, we simply don't wanna do that again. So this I think is the perfect study to end with because it's great science, but its limitation is that maybe we like the animals a little too much to do it exactly the way it ought to be done. So that brings me to the end of life in a biodiversity lab. I wanna thank everybody who's attended these, everyone who's there tonight, thank you for being here. Everyone who's been here for other earlier talks, thank you for being here. I also wanna thank the Wagner and my great friends at the Wagner. I am here to do talks for you forever. Whenever you want me to talk, I don't even care if it's something I know about, I'll talk about it. I love doing talks. I've given lots of talks at the Wagner. I've given talks for the Wagner at other venues. And again, we said tonight, this is the first remote talk at the Wagner. And I have loved being a part of this. So thank you everybody for that. But I wanna leave you with one thing. What is the final most important takeaway? Out of all the work we do in my lab, all of the great animals we keep, and all these great questions, shoaling in fish, sexual behavior in Drosophila, uh, assurance colonies with turtles, road mortality, climate change with frogs, what is the single most important thing that happens? And it happened this week. This to me is more exciting than all the rest. These are three brand new babies. This is a Gulf Coast box turtle who hatched on Saturday, a fit in perfect way to celebrate World Turtle Day. And these are two Eastern mud turtles that hatched yesterday. I've actually got these guys. Oh, by the way, Marty's here. Marty's been here for every talk. Um, this is the Gulf Coast box turtle. I mean, right? <laughs> and um, bear with me. I won't hold them both. Oh, my feisty little guy. That is one of the mud turtles. <laughs> to me, there couldn't be any better week. <laughs> All right, again, thank you everybody. I appreciate everyone for being there and I would be thrilled to answer any questions you've got about any of this stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. And um, what was the name of the baby mud turtle that you showed? Or box you know what? The mud turtle babies, we could have a contest. They don't have a name. The baby uh, Gulf Coast box turtle her name is Rohini, which is a word that doesn't mean anything except to me and my wife. Uh, Rohini is the first name of a cricket sportscaster, a woman in India who has a radio show that talks about the sport cricket. I'll be glad to answer questions about that if you want, but the little box turtle's name is Rohini. Oh, and yes, tonight I failed to introduce everyone to Marty. For all of these talks and everything I do in my office here at work, this is Marty. He's one of our rescues. He's always on my desk or in my lap. Strange life. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to sort through. I've got a lot of questions coming in, which is great. Um, okay. Please continue sending them if you have them. Um, first question was if you study tortoises as well. Tortoises are, are a little bit harder. They're a little bit harder to get and they often require some environmental parameters that we can't duplicate. There's a lot of tortoises that like the weather to be very dry. And Philadelphia is a place, as many of you know, that has a, a lot of humidity. And so as hard as we work, we wouldn't be able to overcome humidity. It's a parameter that's hard to, to overcome. So I love tortoises, but um, we mostly don't work with any, but we have two. We have a little tortoise named Tavoric. He's a Russian tortoise. He's a little male 
who was given to me by Scott Gilbert, who's a great friend of the Wagner. He was a, a professor at Swarthmore. And I gave some talks at Swarthmore. And at the end of one of my talks, he presented me with this wonderful little tortoise who had been found walking down the street in Swarthmore. Uh, so we have Tavorik, and Tavorik has a girlfriend um, named Nami, uh, Mishka, and she's a bit bigger. Uh, and they live on the roof in our greenhouse, but, and they're the only tortoises we have. And um, has there been a follow-up study to, or a follow-up to study the effectiveness of the drift fences on road mortality for the um, diamondback terrapins? The answer, that's a great question. The answer is no. Uh, the drift fences are there, but to run that as a study would then take a replication of what we'd done before, which is constant monitoring of the entire region of the Great Bay Boulevard uh, with particular interest on the regions near the drift fences. It seems obvious, but the work, the intensity of that work, and there are students there every year whose job it is to help those terrapins across the road and help them back and then dig up the eggs to incubate in captivity. The workload's so great that at the moment, we haven't had an opportunity to run that as a study. So the answer is, uh, that's a great idea that needs to be done. As a matter of fact, uh, that'd be a good master's project if anybody out there is looking for a project. Um, someone asks, what are the critters on your last slide? I think um, Sticky and I forget which other animal was on there. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. Uh, <clears throat> this is Sticky. Uh, Sticky's a crested gecko who is also a rescue. Sticky doesn't have a tail. And in the pet shop trade, that is deemed unsellable. They treat, the pet shop trade doesn't treat animals particularly well. So Sticky came to us. We weren't really in the market for a crested gecko. It's an animal I'd never had before, but she's absolutely spectacular. But, um, and she's very personable and very photogenic. And this is a second crested gecko that we brought in also as a rescue, who also has lost her tail. They're both, they're, they're females. This one doesn't have a, a name. We simply call her Sticky's girlfriend. Uh, again, it's a good naming opportunity. Sticky's fairly famous. She's actually a cover girl. And if you look behind me on the wall is a framed uh, cover of a magazine and that's Sticky on the cover of it. So she's, and she's, she lives right here in my office. If I do this, I'm gonna unplug my, I'm sure I'm gonna screw something up. But Sticky lives, Sticky and her girlfriend both live right there in my office. And if you follow the lab's Facebook page, there's sometimes videos of Sticky doing various things, like eating very slowly. Yeah, we like showing short videos of Sticky, and she likes to lick her eyeballs. And there's something that you just can't turn away from watching an animal lick its eyeball. <laughs> um, the next question is someone who's um, a friend and colleague of Fran Russo, um, and asks if there's any hand animals that you handle that you're fearful of. Oh my gosh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I've been treated badly by uh, a lot of animals. Um, we have, for the most part, turtles bite. And the bigger they get, the, the worse their bite is. Now, mostly turtles are, are calm, but if we ever have the occasion where we have to take them out of the water, uh, yeah, you have to respect that. And so we're very careful about that. And we also, we love snapping turtles. <laughs> uh, my daughter, when she was in college, used to collect baby snapping turtles. My daughter's, a, a, I, I hope she doesn't mind me saying this, she's a nut like I am. Um, but she used to collect baby snapping turtles and we would raise them either in her room or in, in the lab and then take them back as big <clears throat> snapping turtles and release them back in the pond up at, at Vassar College. Uh, so any animals like that that you handle, uh, you've got to treat with a lot of respect. The poison dart frogs, you have to be really careful of. And we never, you never handle a poison dart frog. It's just dumb because the poison is on their skin. So whenever we move poison dart frogs from place to place, you wear gloves. It's, it's a, you, know, you wear gloves 
and you use little cups, moving them into cups. So we have a great deal of respect for them. And we do our best never to, uh, to touch them. One time, a long time ago, my best friend in the whole world, as a joke, sent me a scorpion. And uh, it was a deadly <clears throat> type of Western scorpion. And he was a, a real joker. He had a great sense of humor. Uh, he sent me this as a, in a Christmas package and he didn't tell me the scorpion was in the package. Uh, but it was a great animal. We kept it in the lab for about five years. It was really scary, but we kept it. And this was your best friend? Yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. He was my, my best friend, but again, he had, a, he had an interesting sense of humor. <laughs> um. Are there programs to find new habitats for turtles to help them adapt to climate change? Uh, say that, read it again, I'm sorry. Oh, um, are there programs to find new habitats for turtles to help them adapt to climate change? And actually there's kind of a linked question, which was um, whether one could conclude from your studies that um, on turtles and frogs, that turtles are more adaptable. Yeah, I'll start with the second part. Turtles are considered to be very highly adaptable animals. It, it doesn't mean that they don't have problems and they don't have issues that you have to be cautious of. But in general, they're pretty tough. And the reason that you know that is that if you see pollution, particularly in rivers, uh, turtles are one of the last things to show any ill effects. The fish and amphibians go first. Uh, so turtles are relatively tough, but that doesn't mean there's not a lot of really nasty things going on out there that will get them. In terms of amphibians, they breathe through their skin. So the frogs actually exchange gases across their skin. And that's why amphibians have to be moist at all times. And um, any change in water chemistry is has a dramatic impact on amphibians. So they're very, very susceptible. As far, as far as new habitats for species, for the most part, the biggest problem for all species in the world is loss of habitat. And it's not a question of finding a new place for animals to live. Those new places, for the most part, aren't out there. What happens is the places they live are being taken away. So I don't know of any programs that are looking for new places, but there are a lot of programs out there trying to reestablish the places the animals ought to be. The best of, well, one of the best is, um, oh my gosh, I can't think of the name of it now. I'll think of it in a moment. There's a group that purchases land. It purchases swamp land and forest areas, places that are, um, that have very rare species and they simply protect them from being developed by people. And really that's the best thing you can do for a species is to find the place it normally lives and save it. Um, and this is also related, I guess. Um, is the decline of these species due to habitat loss, over harvesting for human use, or disease? Um, and then another question is specifically about the um, Vietnamese leaf turtle, asking why it's so severely declining in the wild. Yeah, all the, by the way, all these are great questions. Um, in terms of species that become endangered, you know, their populations begin to decline. I do this in my environmental science class. Every species has its own issue. So if you look at something like tuna, it's over harvesting, right? They're a commercial food product. We're very good at catching them. We use huge nets and they're collected in huge numbers. And so for an animal like that, that's the biggest issue. For other species, it might be, it might be a type of pollution like bald eagles for a while were being affected by mercury or DDT. Different species have different issues. It all depends on where they are and what's happening. However, the single biggest issue for every species on the planet, even us, is loss of habitat, which is the amount of available space is being reduced. And for other species, it's because humans are building roads and building shopping centers and building buildings and paving over the planet. And so habitat loss 
is part of the problem for every species, and then some species have something else. Now, in terms of the Vietnamese leaf turtles, there are lots of turtles all across Asian countries. Their problems are habitat loss, same as everything else. Harvesting for food, which is a very big problem in a lot of Asian countries with turtles. There is a far bigger issue with turtles in those countries than it is in a place like America. But for something like the Vietnamese leaf turtle, they reside almost exclusively in rice paddies. And rice paddies are an interesting ecosystem. It's a, it's a grassland that is submerged. So a, a rice paddy has a small layer of water, you know, six to seven inches with emergent grass, rice is a grass. And so these grasslands are shelved and terraced. You, you, you do rice paddies in these terraces where it flatlands you set up. The natural animals and plants that live in that area are things that live with natural rice. And for a long time, when rice was planted by hand and, and harvested by hand, the normal species did just fine. And there's fish that live in these waters. There's other plants that live in these waters. And so rice paddies and natural animals and plants had a nice balance. As a matter of fact, by keeping the rice paddies, you protected the other species. But now, in many countries, there are automated rice planters and pickers with these huge wheels that just chop the entire rice paddy to bits, planting as they go and harvest, harvest in the front, plant in the back. And what's happening is the other species that normally shared that area with the rice, they're just getting wiped out. And so the natural area for a thing like a Vietnamese leaf turtle they just the region they normally are found is is just isn't there anymore. They can't they can't stay there. Uh, and back to the U.S. Someone asks if red-eared sliders in the U.S. are mostly from released pets, and um, if invasive turtles are an issue. Yeah, red-eared sliders are only found in the southern U.S. So you find them naturally from about North Carolina down through Florida. And that's it, that's their natural range. But these are the pet shop turtles. When I was a little kid, you could buy a turtle in the pet shop for a dime and every pet shop had them. And they were harvested by the millions and sold all over the US and they were shipped to Europe and to Asia. Everybody had these as pets. Everybody my age knows about these little green pet shop turtles. Eventually a law was passed that made it more difficult for the people who farm these animals to sell them, but they're still out there. But in terms of them now being found, they're, they're, they've become a cosmopolitan species. They're found all across North America, all through Central America, South America, all through Europe, in places that never had any turtles before, Africa, Australia, just about everywhere. And all of those turtles are releases. They've just been released. And red-eared sliders get a really bad knock. People, the word invasive is such a nasty thing. It sounds like they're, they're coming to get us. The problem is they're, they're wonderful turtles. They didn't ask for this. They just happen to be remarkably adaptive. And they go out into the wild. They find themselves into a body of water and they can do just fine under almost every climate and every habitat. But since they're called invasive, people seem to hate them and think that they're a big environmental problem. And what I always tell environmentalists and students of environmental science, people need to focus on the big problem. Uh, Red-eared sliders aren't going to be a big issue for the world. They just aren't. And first of all, we're never going to solve it. They're there. Get used to it. And all the people, there's a lot of turtle people out there who say, oh my God, they're wiping out populations of natural turtles. I promise you, there isn't one lick of real science showing that. None. They're out there. If they're having an effect, it might be an interesting study, but people aren't studying it. But they're not doing any harm that we know of, and it's part of the natural ecology now. So, and, but the answer to the question is, yeah, if you see a red-eared slider in a place it shouldn't be, it was somebody's pet. Or it's the descendant of somebody's pet. Um, someone asks if the lab is ever open to the public. Oh, well, I was going to say right always. <laughs> I, these days, that, that's a loaded question. 
Um, once we solve the pandemic, and we'll solve the pandemic, it's going to take a while, but we'll solve it. But the lab is always open. And one of the best things we do is bring visitors in. And we have school groups that come in. We have other universities that come in and see us. We have every group you could imagine comes by. And just anybody who, who sends me a note and wants to come by. So, yeah, as soon as this gets solved, everybody come and visit. Um, what is the rarest animal you've ever encountered in the lab or in your travels? And is there one animal that's on your bucket list to see? Uh, <laughs> well, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I'm too complicated with animals to give you a simple answer to that first one. Uh, like, what's the rarest thing? In terms of the lab, the rarest thing we've ever had in the lab, I, I know there's a bunch of my lab people out there listening in. Uh, if anybody out there who's worked in the lab has an answer to this, send it, because I'm drawing a blank. I mean, my first answer is those, um, those spotted turtles from India. They were the hardest thing we ever got. We worked for over 15 years to get permission to bring them in. But I still feel like there's probably something rarer. As far as my bucket list, um, yeah, that, <clears throat> that's complicated. There's a lot of stuff that I would love to have in the lab that I simply don't have the setup for. I would love to have and breed clownfish. I love them. They, 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 I just think they're the most wonderful thing. And I know people who breed them and it just, it blows your mind to see tanks of tiny clownfish. But we're not set up to do salt water. So that's a bucket list item that I don't think I'll get. Um, there's an, an animal called a mata mata turtle, which is probably the strangest turtle in the world. I've got pictures of one, but I actually don't know how to go back and find them right now. They are really bizarre. Look it up. It's called Mata M-A-T-A, M-A-T-A. It's a South American turtle. It doesn't look like anything that should even be from the earth. And I've, sat, I've had my bucket list aspect to it because I had one for about a week. Great. They're great big. And it was a visitor to my lab, and I took lots of pictures of it. I love being around it. But uh, they only can be fed live fish. And that's, again, everyone who knows the lab, that's not what we do. So while I love it, it's not the sort of thing we would raise. So I got to have one for a little while, but then we let it go on. You know, that's a good, those are good questions. I'll probably come up with a dozen more answers to that, but that's the best I can do right now. Haley suggests um, the blue poison dart frogs who are extinct in the wild is the rarest one. You, who said that? Haley. Kelly, good job. Um, hold on. I thought I had a picture of them. I think slide one. Oh, there it is. Here it is. Here it is. Uh, there. So yes. So this is a pl a blue poison dart frog, which. And Kaylee's right. This is an animal that is extinct in the wild. It's a poison dart frog. It's actually a very, very closely related species to the black and white poison dart frogs that we did the experiment with. Uh, it turns out that a lot of poison dart frogs are very closely related, even though they look remarkably different. This animal was found over a series of mountain ranges in Suriname in South America. And the region that they lived was cut flat timbered, just every single tree taken down and hauled out. And it wiped out everything in that area. And this frog was only found in that area and was wiped out. Now, the good news about poison dart frogs are, uh, blue poison dart frogs are, they do very well in captivity. And they're now actually found in a number of laboratories around the world. So there's plenty of them left in the world. But not in the wild. And she's right. That was something that I had always wanted. And uh, they are remarkable animals. And also, just as an aside, one thing I've learned from some of the reading I've done on uh, biological chemistry is that blue 
is a very hard thing for living organisms to make. Blue turns out to take a lot of really complicated chemicals. And so whenever you see animals or plants that have blue in them, there's some fairly complicated chemistry going on. But anyway, that's a good, a good answer. Um, Matt, who's nine years old, asks, if a frog has poison on him like a poison dart frog and he uses his poison on a predator, how does he get more poison? Oh, that's a great question. Thanks. Uh, that's Matt. That's a terrific question. The frogs make this poison regularly. It's, a, it's, a, it's on their skin and it, they, don't, they don't constantly produce it. They produce it when something's happening to them. So if a frog is just sitting there, it's not making it. But if you grab it or if you harass it in some way or, for, or if a predator grabs it, the frog begins putting it out. You know what, it's a little bit like sweating. So think about people, if you do some very rigorous exercise, you begin to sweat. For these poison dart frogs, if they're stressed in any way, they begin to produce this. So when they're stressed, they'll produce it. If they get rid of the predator and then the frog goes on, it can make more of this stuff the next time it, it, it needs to. So they can make it whenever they need to make it. And they don't make it constant, they only make it when there's a need. And related to that, um, would the blue poison dart frog also have indican, like in the indigo plant? Um, and I guess I'll group these together. Second to last question, is there any medicinal purpose um, related to the toxin in the frog's skin? Um, I don't know about the, the first part of the, the indigen. I'm not sure if, that, if that's a chemical. I think I just, I'm not familiar. And I don't actually know the, the, the biochemistry of the color in these animals. As far as the toxins, all poison dart frogs appear to be slightly different in the toxin they produce. And they run the gamut from some that are relatively mild, you, you, wouldn't, wanna, you wouldn't wanna lick them, but uh, relatively mild to extremely dangerous. There, there's a thing called a golden poison frog that for a long time was a myth. It was mythological. There were a lot of scientists who actually were asking whether it was real or not. There was this talk of a large poison frog, a large yellow poison frog that would kill a human on touch. And it, it had this legendary status. And then it sure it turns out that sure enough, it's true. <laughs> there are these great big ones. They're, they've got a colony of them at the Philadelphia Zoo right now, and they're absolutely flat out deadly. As far as being used for medicinal purposes, the only one I know of is a frog that I actually have an entire colony of in the lab, and it's a thing called a Pipitobates tricolor, and it doesn't have a common name. That's its scientific name, a Pipitobates tricolor, and it's a wonderful little poison frog. They're tiny little guys. They're reddish in color with stripes. And we've bred them for many, many years. We get tadpoles and babies. We haven't done any real work with them, but we've got them and we love them. They have a terrific song and they sing night and day in my lab. If you come visit, you'll hear them night and day. It turns out that the toxin that they make is a thing called epibatidine. And it's a chemical that scientists had never seen before. Its structure is very unusual. And once it was discovered, it was tested in medical studies in with rats and it found out that the toxic effects were from anesthesia it was it was a type of anesthesia but it anesthetized you so much that you died and so it was tested for a long time and there were clinical trials well it was set for clinical trials in europe to see if they could modify it so that it would not be toxic but it could still be used as an anesthetic for people who are allergic to current anesthetics I'm not sure that those tests had gone anywhere positive, but I know about 10 years ago, there were groups working with those and they could synthesize it so they didn't need the frogs anymore. Uh, it was a great success story that showed that Ecuador, which allowed scientists to come and work in the rainforest, actually made a fair amount of money with this discovery because it was an indigenous, uh, indigenous species. Uh, so there has been work on a medical advantage to the toxin, but I don't know that it's gone anywhere. Thanks. Um, I think 
we'll end there for time. So it just as a kind of final message for everyone. Um, and thank you, Scott, for another great talk. And thank you for everyone who joined us. And Thanks, and everybody. Yeah, on. so I, I just also wanted to thank everyone and um, hope you'll come back and join us. Uh, this was so successful um, that we're putting together a series of weekly talks in this time slot for um, June and July. We'll have probably a different speaker every week. We'll announce it in our e-newsletter. So if you haven't gotten our e-newsletter, um, please sign up for it. And um, we hope that you'll join us for more programs at the Wagner. I also had put in the chat that we will be sending out a survey and we'd love to hear your thoughts and comments, which we'll also share back with Scott. Um, for those who made donations, we really appreciate it. And um, if you're interested in helping support the way and you do more programs, please consider becoming a member. Um, we hope you'll join us for more talks, both virtually and at the Wagner when we reopen. And many thanks to Scott for pioneering this whole series with us. Thanks, Thank everyone, you. and good night. Thanks. Night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Scott.